Joe, Thank white you. voice. Her white voice? <laughs> <It's> her. <laughs> figure out how to use this thing. I appreciate it. You know, it's funny, uh, Jim and I put together these presentations and we certainly didn't talk before we put them together, but I appreciate the fact you used my oldest technology in comparing to Fulton's newest technology. <laughs> <laughs> we want to talk a little bit about that. We're an older company. What's old is old and what's new is new. So, if I figure out how to work this thing, we'll be all set. In 1928, Earl C. Reed founded two companies within a day of each other. And ironically, they were, they were originally founded as cast iron radiator manufacturing companies. And you typically will not see cast iron radiators anymore other than for replacement market. It's just not something that the technology has developed beyond that point. And ironically, he called them the Utica Radiator Corporation and the Dunkirk Radiator Corporation. And I'll give you a guess as to where these two plants were located. <laughs> Later on, we started to build sectional uh, boiler assemblies. And if you notice, this is an actual shaker grate, so what does that tell you? These were hand-fired cold products. So these were not burning a fuel oil, they were not burning gas. This is older technology. And this happened to be our red square boiler. At some point, if we have an opportunity, I'll bring one in here, a little small sample, and show you. It's, it's pretty unique in terms of how our salesmen used to market this product. In 1937, we actually had this great, which we thought was a great idea, but we're going to wash the air. Now, this unit literally had a water vessel in here, and as the air passed across it, it had a spinner ring, and it would literally wash out the particles. So you could dehumidify the air, you could humidify the air, you could cool it with this little coil arrangement. It also had windows in there so that as you're cleaning that dirty air, you'd flush it out. I think at that point in time, Legionnaires was one of these things that really wasn't on the forefront. So suffice it to say that we've manufactured that unit for around four years or so. And then what happened in 1937 through the 40s? We should all know this. World War II. Our part of World War II was we actually manufactured hand grenades. And when I say manufactured, we manufactured the casings for the hand grenade. We obviously didn't populate it with the gunpowder and the firing pins and all that other stuff. I had a sample of that, I thought better of bringing it. <laughs> we also made parts, at this point in time, uh, the need was for magnesium castings. So we made parts for the B-29 Superfortress. And you'll notice that we had our employees who actually utilized, these are actually metal badges with their pictures on it. A lot of our manufacturing during this time was pretty much unknown. Why? Because of security reasons. So we were manufacturing for the war effort. In 1978, the grandson, Earl C. Reed, of our founder, decided, you know what, Dad, I'm a runner, and I want to give back to the community. So I want you to take a look at this. This is what his dad gave him, $750 budget. So what does that tell you? Here, here's $750, leave me alone. <laughs> so that first race had some 800 runners, and if you look today, we have over 17,000 people who run in the Utica Boilermaker. Where does the name come from? Well, obviously, we made boilers. And FX Mats, what did he make? Alcohol, and what's a boiler maker? <laughs> it's a drink. So pretty clever. So this year, we're looking forward to seeing some 17,000 plus people run down the streets of Utica. So from 1988 to 1997, we realized that the boiler industry was changing. Our conventional products were changing. Our sales were decreasing. We needed to venture out into other areas. So what did we do? In 1988, we decided it made sense to purchase EMI, which was Environmental or EnviroMaster International, which was a manufacturer in Rome. And I'll show you in a minute what they made. Then in 1990, we decided that we were going to go ahead and buy the Oneida Royal Furnace. That was another company that their sales had been dropping. And we saw an opportunity there to do something on, in two segments of the industry where we really hadn't played before. So short of that washed air conditioning unit that we only made for four years, that was really the extent of what we were doing on what I'm going to refer to as the forced air side. In 1997, the Boilermaker was the top 15K road race in the country. Because of our size of the community, we cannot exceed the 17,000 runners. And we actually capped that race, and it actually sells out in probably about four to five days. So in 1996, we introduced the Quantum Leap. 
This was somewhat of a unique technology in that we had a gas burner in here, and then we had a recuperative cooling tower, and then we would basically take the condensate that was developed, recycle it through this to get additional heat. So that allowed us to have a very high AFUE, and it did not necessarily regard to the return water temperature because of this evaporative recirping loop and the capability of expanding that additional heat energy. One of the problems with this design is what? Jimmy talked about complexity of design. This is about as complex as it's going to get. We had a drain assembly here. We had a condensate pump. We had an evaporative recooling tower. We had a lot of technology built into this, and we learned from that. But was that technology marketable technology? At that point in time, initially it was. But as other products came out on the market, that technology waned. So we realized we had to do something different. In 1998, we received an R&D magazine award for that technology. So in 1999, and bear in mind, in 1999, the two companies came together. And the two companies were really, at this point, had become the Utica Boiler Company and the Dunkirk Boiler Company. Where does the name ECR International come from? The two families had owned those two companies. And in order to equalize that, you're on the left side of the room and the right side of the room, what did you do? Well, let's name it in honor of Earl C. Reed, the founder. So when we tell people we're ECR International, <coughs> telling them you're ECR International makes it look like we are a huge multinational corporation, when in reality, we're still a privately held company, in part owned by the Reed family. In 2006, we took some uh, monoblock aluminum technology and came up with a modulating boiler design. I'll talk about that in a minute. And in this sense, this is just the uh, heat exchanger. Condensate would flow out the bottom. And this was an early precursor of some of our other designs. It looks like we uh, missed your program. In 2010, we spent our 14 million. So obviously, it would have been nicer for us to wait till 2013 when we had some other dollars available. At this point in time, we realized that even though the building and the facility was an older facility, we realized that we had to create our technology and get us up to snuff within the manufacturing that you see in the global markets today. We had to do it. There was no choice. This is actually the inside of that old ratty looking building you saw the first picture of. So to say that uh, it's modern, we have an older look but a modern facility internal. This happened to be some of the, some of the uh, uh, reconstruction we did at our Utica plant. We also did some um, psychometric labs in there. We have four psychometric lab centers. The reason we did that was so that we could test air conditioning products as well as our boiler products. So we fully invested in both the Utica and the Dunkirk plants. During that time, we consolidated and we closed our Rome facility. Why? Because it didn't make sense to be in Rome, New York, and Utica, New York, when in reality, you're what? 10 minutes away. So there was not any sense in doing that. Here's some pictures of our Utica facility. This happens to be one of our condensing boiler test lines. This is our final test station. Here's some products running down the line. We also manufacture some of our air conditioning products at the Utica facility. And when I say manufacture air conditioning, we are by no stretch of the imagination the size of a McQuay, a carrier, a train, or any of those companies. We are more along the lines of what I would refer to as a specialty manufacturer. In Dunkirk, they manufacture and fabricate both our jackets assemblies as well as our cast iron blocks. We actually buy the cast iron heat exchangers. There are patterns. They're, they're actually poured into a pack of foundry. And then we do all the machining on our machining centers. And we do all of our sheet metal fabrication on our Salvanini sheet metal machines. And we manufacture our furnace line in Dunkirk. So Dunkirk is the facility that presses the blocks together for our cast iron section of boilers. They're shipped to our Utica facility, and then the final assembly takes place there. Boiler products and brands, you probably know us by maybe these two brands, or quite frankly, um, if I could get a show of hands in the room, who in this room's ever owned a boiler? Who in this room didn't even know what a boiler was? <laughs> Usually you'll get hands that go up, and that's not an embarrassing thing because we'll find situations where they call a furnace a boiler and vice versa because unless you've owned a home in the Northeast, 
you typically wouldn't have experience with that. You'd be more experienced with what? Forced air furnace systems. So we manufacture Dunkirk, Utica boilers, those are our core brands. Utica heating, Green Mountain, uh, Argo is an electric boiler, and then we also have Penco, which is another one of our brands. Uh, everything from a 38,000 up to 3 million, and when I say that, we're really more in what I'm going to refer to as the residential slash light commercial. I would say Fulton Boilers, you guys are probably in the heavy commercial, industrial range, is that fair? Yeah. Okay. Argo Electric Boilers, uh, this is actually manufactured in one of these collaborations with the Fulton companies. So we're actually in the process of doing a development on this and we're changing some of the electronics in this thing. We're also looking at updating some of the other controls that we offer. These controls are used if you have a boiler that has multiple zones, whether it's valves or pumps, you need a way to send a signal from the thermostat through a relay device and then turn on what we refer to as the boiler or the appliance. Olson and Airco, these are oil and gas furnaces. Um, the oil furnace, what you're going to see with that is that is trending down and down and down. What we found is because we're a smaller manufacturer, it affords us a niche opportunity. Why? Carrier, trains, your Lennox, they don't want to make oil furnaces. They're not into that. Why would they not be there? There's no, there's no scope of volume. There's no size there. They can't do those things thousands at a time because the industry is too small. EMI, these were some of the units that originally we had a unit that instead of having on a multiple head unit, this would be the outdoor section, you could use a cassette, a high wall, or this was either wall or floor mount. Our initial design is if we had a single zone system, it would be here to here, or here to here, or here to here, or here to here. Or we had a multiple zone where you could put any combination of these three heads on an outdoor unit. What was unique about that is each one was an individual compressor circuit. So at that point in time, it was something that was unique. Uh, nobody else was really doing it in that way. I'm not saying it was the right way or the wrong way. It was just a unique way. As we've moved into the in, in converter technology, this has become what? It, it, it's... The technology is really more advanced than this, but we still have applications where because it's a simple design and if you lose one compressor, you haven't lost your whole capability to cool the area. So you'll still see some of those units. We also have a niche in that we can put in because some of these cabinets have larger volume sizes. We can put in electric strip heat, so in a heat pump application, you can truly do heating down to zero degrees with the electric, so that's not a problem. Our retro air line, this is really manufacturing equipment that used to be manufactured by other, other people who are no longer in that business. This goes back to our niche manufacturing. These are the type of units you would see, uh, New York City, Chicago, Boston. If you've ever looked at one of those buildings, and I'm not talking about the, the 100 floor buildings, but your typical 15 to 20 story building where you'll see grill assemblies on the outside of the building. We manufacture units that can mate up to those existing assemblies that were no longer being produced by the original equipment manufacturers. So that affords us the opportunity where we'll take a, an order for something like this. This may be a one or 200 piece order. So that allows us to make a custom unit. There's little baffle pieces in here. We can match it to whether they need some coils in there, heat pumps, electric heat, whatever they're looking for. So this really, that's where the name Retro Air came from. It was a refit unit of something that somebody else manufactured. Some of the things that we are dealing with now are the DOE compliances for new construction, even though a lot of these are in retrofit applications, and you tell the DOE nobody's making this anymore, they still have that efficiency points. And okay, that's fine, we'll, we'll get there. Absolutely can get there. Some of our, our customers, if you see a carrier boiler, it was manufactured by ECR International. If you see Train, Lennox, Olson Canada, Nordyne, Columbia, Wild McLean, we, we do some controls for Wild McLean and Bell and Gossett. We do some oil furnaces for York and Nordyne. Kenmore Sears units. Uh, the story goes that our, one of our first orders was from Sears. We are one of the longest continuous supplier of Sears. And back in the day when they had those catalogs, you could actually buy a house from Sears Corporation no longer the case, but back in those time periods, you could certainly do that. 
Who are our wholesale distribution partners? We do what we call step distribution. We sell our products through a wholesaler who in turn sells it to an installing contractor who in turn sells it to an end user consumer. So some of our, some of our partners, which you'll find branches right here in Syracuse, Earth Supply Centers, Ari Michael, Sid Harvey's, I believe you have all three of those located in Syracuse, New York. AF Supply, he's down in the city, Robinson's in the city, Bell Simons and Wallington. So primarily you'll see where these are larger companies, much larger than we are, that have distribution all across uh, the Northeast as well as now they're expanding. And I believe Ari Michaels just opened up a branch out on the West Coast. As far as supply chain partners, let me apologize to the Fulton companies. Your logo is not up here, it should be. Uh, Wapaka, that's the foundry who pours our castings for our conventional cast iron sectional boilers. They're still our patterns, they do the pours there. Fasco is the inducer company, Gunner Motors. Takeo Pumps, ICM Controls, Genmark Steel. We buy our steel for our manufacturing process to manufacture our jackets. Honeywell, those are obviously controls, and things that are used on our boilers. Field controls, uh, manufacturer of vent dampers, electronic vent dampers. Beckett Corporation of uh, oil burners, as well as they have a division uh, that makes ribbon tube gas burners, atmospheric, similar to what you would see in your gas grill, where you would go ahead and light that and things of that nature, just to give you an idea of what we're talking about when we talk about ribbon tube burners. So as a result of our expansion, what did we introduce in 2010? These are actually our newer products, Jim. So if you have an opportunity, Sorry. if you have an opportunity to show some of our products, <laughs> these are a couple of our new ones. We're really proud of this. They were designed and developed at our RD Center in, in uh, Utica, New York, tested. What makes this somewhat unique in our industry? Uh, we use a coil heat exchanger. We mount it in a vertical position. It's a 316 tube with laser welded fins. Why is that important? Because as that flue gas passes through here, you get a full condensate drain and development off of it, as opposed to a horizontally positioned coil where you can get some sedimentation built up on the flue gas side. And because our heat exchanger is a more open tube design, we don't have as much capability in scaling as something with a more finer flue openings, or excuse me, waterway openings. The other thing that we realized is these two products, both our Dunker, or excuse me, both our Utica and our Dunker, we're playing catch up here with the Europeans. So how do we play catch up? We had to do something different than what they were offering. So what we did is we included the pump inside the boiler that will constantly flow the right amount of water through the heat exchanger. And then the contractor can connect both his supply and returns as if it was a conventional boiler. He does not have to do extensive external piping. We've included that on the, on the inside. Another thing you're gonna find is that this is using pre-mixed gas technology. All that means is we're bringing in outside air. It goes through this Venturi assembly, which has a motor on it. It draws in the gas air mixture across and then is ignited in the cell. There's sensors on the supplies and returns so that the boiler is able to uh, look at conditions. Are we dissipating the heat energy that the boiler is putting out? If not, what do we do? We can throttle down the gas input. So on a 100,000 boiler, we can go with a 5 to 1 turndown. We can modulate anywhere between 20,000 and 100,000. On a day like this, we might set the water temperature, automatically set it for 180. If it's 40 degrees out or 45, even though you might still need heating, the controls have an outdoor sensor that says, oh, I don't need that much heat energy. What's it do? It not only reduces the flame sets, but it can also reduce the delivery water temperature. So these are not your grandfather's boilers anymore. These have probably as much technology and sophistication as you'll find in any residential products that are out in the market uh, for heating and cooling your home. Current research and development projects that we have underway, we're looking at expanding our condensing offering. We want to go a little bit bigger to fill it out. Here again, we're playing catch up. We want to make sure that we have as full of an offering is anybody else out there? And what I mean by that is our competitors, the people that we compete with, which are typically uh, European boiler manufacturers, probably 10 to 20 times our size, and both dollar scope, employees, and so on and so forth. And that's probably under exaggerated. The other thing that we have is we're looking at expanding into chilled water cassettes. Here again, we see that this is going to be an addition to our current chilled water line. Um, 
This affords us an opportunity for those jobs that, uh, here again, just you want a ceiling to set unit, you don't want to put in DX type systems, you already got chilled water lines going through it. So we can offer you a uh, chilled water to set on that. <clears throat> here again, these are going to be manufactured in our Utica, New York facility. Everter, you talked a little bit about that. Well, yeah, we're playing there too. <laughs> What we're looking at doing is, um, you'd be better described at how these work than I would. In terms of uh, what this does is it modulates down the compressor speed based on conditions so that if you have three or four different zones calling and you only have one calling, you don't necessarily need the full compression capability. Is that the correct way to put that in my non-technical terms? So as you start to do that, what happens is your efficiencies go up. So now you have a situation where your efficiencies are able to go up and you're only running the compressor at the loading that you need to run. Opportunities and challenges. Um, you know, we're manufacturing in New York State. We intend to be in New York State. We find that we're smaller. We have to be smarter. We have to be more nimble than some of our competitors because of our size. We can do that. Our challenges are really um, large, our large competitors are huge. I mean, their global interests are just huge. They have a lot more critical mass than we have, which is fine. Cost of doing business in New York, you know, let's all raise our hands. We can all cry that sad story, but the reality is we choose to be here. And since we choose to be here, let's not even put that as, as something that we can't work around. I really believe that we can work around that. We've been in business since 1928 and we're still here. We've had to do things differently, more with less, but we're still here. This is funny, you get the same thing. When we've actually tried to hire experienced engineers, what I mean by that, because the boiler industry is so small, your capability of hiring an engineer who's experienced in that, typically you get them from people who are inside our industry. And one of the, one of the challenges we have is this uh, upstate New York move area. You know, we do have engineers that look at our facility and say, yeah, we love what you're doing. We think that's great, but by the way, I don't think I want to relocate my family. Look outside. I don't want to relocate here. So, but it's, it's something that uh, we just have to work hard at. Development costs and infrastructure, that, that goes hand in hand with what we see in our industry. Yes, we are regulated. And we as a manufacturer believe that we have a responsibility to provide safe, efficient, and what I'm going to refer to as socially responsible products. What do I mean by that? We, that means that we're not going to sit here and tout the benefits of lower technologies. We want everybody to be in higher level of technologies. Unfortunately, our, our biggest mover is our lowest level of technology in terms of efficiency. We are selling products that people truly do not feel that they really want to buy. And what I mean by that is if you buy a flat screen TV, are you happy? If I tell you you need a boiler, are you happy? <laughs> You're not happy. So we have to overcome that short-term expenditure and say, okay, what is the long-term capability of a product? Our products have a 95% efficiency rating versus a conventional boiler that might be in the 80s. So what do we need to do? That's on us as a manufacturer to tell the end user as well as the installing contractor you know, why do you want to buy that higher level of technology? Not just for the efficiency, but for the modulation and the other benefits that go along with it. Opportunities, research and development funds, that's always something that we need. Training. Uh, we don't really, we truly realize that I would not say that what I'm doing in Utica, New York, or Dunkirk is truly advanced manufacturing. And what I mean by that is I would dare say that there are probably manufacturers within our area who make our line runs look like it's circa 1915. I really don't know. And that's part of our challenge. We obviously aren't going to have the opportunity to visit our competitors and see how they manufacture. But we can learn from other manufacturers. This goes back to that, that collaboration. New York State incentive programs, we, we understand they're out there. Uh, New York State has an extensive amount of funds that are available in terms of projects. We're not looking for somebody to say, okay, we want to specify either our product or Fulton's product or Fitzer's just because we are here. What we're saying is let's at least look at an opportunity there from a manufacturer's standpoint. Contact, this is something that we really need to start looking at doing as we expand what we're trying to do. 
uh, contact with specifying engineering community. We're trying to identify what they need because here again, even though right now we are manufacturing in what I would refer to as the residential slash light commercial arena, we certainly aren't playing in a true commercial <clears throat> arena. This goes hand in hand with what we're trying to do with some of our chilled water units and things of that nature more so than on the boiler side. So we need that capability. And then design and modeling predictive software systems. And that was that was pretty much it. Ed, thank you very much for your time. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll forget yeah. you. Questions for Joe, Bob, Dave. Can you uh, do maintenance and do you train people on how to maintain your equipment? Absolutely. You know, I'm glad you. You know, shame on me. I'm glad you said that. We literally have within our facility, both uh, Utica and Dunkirk, we have a training center, <coughs> which is probably about the size of this room. In addition to that, we also have a live fire display vehicle that we send out and we actually train at locations. So we'll actually go and we'll have a whole schedule. Uh, last year I believe we trained some 500 to 600 installing contractors. So we literally take our resources, we load them up in either our, um, our main display truck or we'll go to a conference center or we'll go to a distributor and we say, listen, we're having a boiler class on our new technology. Please, please come. So a lot of our time and effort is spent on training um, industry installers, contractors. Okay. Ooh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yes. <clears throat> you use a step distribution system. Yes. And that wholesaler must do a lot to add value or you wouldn't use it. <laughs> uh, and you could compare, let's say you have an Asian manufacturer moves right. in to not use a wholesaler to cut out that cost then he would have to use his own sales. Is it sales engineering is where that uh, value add comes from? Well, here, actually what you're saying, there's, there's two parts to your question. Let me address the first part in terms of the value added by our wholesalers. Um, one thing that I would love to tell you is that we are the premier line in a wholesaler. If you were to visit R.E. Michaels company, while they're certainly one of our customers and we certainly value that, we are not what I'm going to refer to as their premier line. They actually have other lines of manufacturers and manufacturer boilers that they're also on. So the, the decision point is really based on the contractor coming in and saying, I want a Utica boiler versus a Wiesman boiler, or I want a Utica boiler versus a Lockenbar boiler. The distributor has both on his shelf in his back area ready to send out. So what we've found is our manufacturing challenge is to get to the installing contractor and convince them that our product, our support, our customer service, our technical support, our training is better so that in the middle of the night, if you do have a problem or something does happen, that you don't feel like you're left out in left field with no one to go to. In regards to the other part of your question for what we would call value added, the wholesaler does two things that are critical. Number one, they offer distribution throughout the entire Northeast. As a manufacturer, we wouldn't be able to do that. The second thing that they're doing is it's easier for us to send invoicing and billing to one individual as opposed to if we went dealer direct, you would magnify that by hundreds. And we can also even out our manufacturing. Why? Because we're in a, in a cycle manufacturing situation. So we do what we call programs to incentivize our larger customers to buy ahead for the season. That allows us to level out our manufacturing capabilities. Did that answer your questions? Yes, thank you. Thank you. What percentage of your sales are international? Oh, I, you know what? I would say, I'm going to tell you, it's, it's probably next to nothing now. When I say international, we used to have um, manufacturing in Canada. I don't call Canada international. Maybe I should. Yes, it is a different country. Okay. So <laughs> I should do that. I apologize. So I would say it's about, including Canada, about 7 8%. Right, somewhere in that range. Unfortunately, we are on the flip side of that. And what I mean by that is we're actually importing stuff. And what I mean by we're importing, uh, we'll have a situation where some of our um, air conditioning products are imported or what we would refer to as a buy resale, not the ones I show you that we're manufacturing. But we also offer what we call a lower cost option for somebody who doesn't want that level of technology, just wants a, a cost effective unit to cool the space. Those are imported units that we then resell. 
Why is it critical for them to want to do business with us? Because we have the distribution channels through our wholesale partners. What would be, what are the challenges to you doing international sales? Any market? Any market international, what we found is because traditionally we were manufacturing products that are cast iron boilers. Cast iron boilers not ship well. The weight is atrocious. It's not like you're sending circuit boards in a container. So if you were to envision taking cast iron product, and we used to ship into to China. We used to ship into the Soviet Union when it was the Soviet Union. So we had SKUs that we did that, but quite frankly, especially with cast iron technology, load out a shipping container and see what your shipping costs are to get it over there and then realize that now with the emergence of everything that's going on in Europe, uh, China has their own manufacturing capabilities. Europe has their own manufacturing capabilities. And quite honestly, then I have to compete against a gentleman who's making 5 million units a year. Those are huge companies that are already in Europe. And we are manufacturing, in a sense, a very small segment in the residential slash like commercial arena. Uh, stop the questioning of Joe. I want to get to the kind of the open discussion time. Sure. Thanks, thanks again, Joe. Thanks, thanks, Jim.